Hi guys, welcome back. We're doing another Cold War lecture. Yes, I look different from lecture part one because I actually did lecture part one on Thursday and today's Friday and now I'm doing lecture part two. Um, so let's jump in here. I'll share my screen with you again. Uh, we're gonna go over the repression in Eastern Europe. We're gonna talk about the Prague Spring and the Brezhnev Doctrine today, as well as the changing relationships between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 70s and into the 80s. So let's jump in here. All right. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Present. Yay. Okay. Um, all right. So uh Spielvogel chapter 29 talks a lot about um the like basically overwhelmingly terrible conditions. Oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, the overwhelmingly terrible conditions in most of the Eastern Bloc. Um, obviously, any country that was in the Soviet sphere of influence um, experienced a high degree of repression. There was like no free speech. All the media was controlled by the state. So it was all just like propaganda all the time. All the education was controlled by the state, etc. Um, the Soviet Union had taken sort of like extra steps to really cut off their parts um, of Europe from sort of the rest of the world. The most famous and obvious example of this is the creation of the Berlin Wall um, in the 1960s, that the Soviets build a literal wall around their part of, uh, around Eastern Berlin, essentially, because what was happening was life in Eastern Berlin um, and larger, you know, Eastern Germany um, was so terrible that in the 19, late 1950s, anyone who could get out of Eastern Germany and Eastern Berlin was doing it. Um, so people from greater Eastern Germany, they would go to Eastern Berlin, then they would cross from East Berlin to West Berlin, and from there they would try and like immigrate out. Um, and what ends up happening is something called the brain drain. Essentially, a lot of the like most uh, intellectual people in Eastern Germany, a lot of the sort of like um, people with high skilled jobs, um, a lot of them wanted to get out. And essentially, you had this mass movement of these sort of like high, um, I don't know what sort I'm looking for, like the, like the basically the top field, top people in every field leaving. Um, and that's why they call it the brain drain, because basically what was left in Eastern Germany um, was essentially like the low skilled workers, the people who were not top in their field, um, the people who either couldn't afford to get out or um, who didn't necessarily have a ton of motivate, as much motivation to get out. Um, so that's why the Soviet Union ends up constructing the Berlin Wall, um, which is pictured right down here. These are actually two photos that my dad took. Um, my dad went to um, Germany in, it must have been like the 80s. Um, so these are two photos from then. So here is a section of the Berlin Wall. And you can see on the other side, I mean, obviously my dad was standing in West Berlin looking over and you can see um, this is East Berlin on the other side. Um, and so you can kind of get the sense of like what kind of place it was. I mean, there's a lot of big apartment buildings um, that are all very like uniform in look. They're all kind of like drab, like they're all kind of just built out of like dark concrete and stuff like that. Um, this area in between here um, is like where they would essentially like have watchtowers and stuff like that. And so sometimes people from East Berlin would try and escape and climb over the wall and get out because literally that's how desperate they were to get out of East Berlin um, and East Germany because of the repression. And oftentimes they were like shot and killed in this area. Um, and so it was a really like violently repressive regime that was existing in East Berlin and in East Germany and basically all of the Eastern Bloc. Um, this is another photo my dad took from over the wall. Um, these are East Berlin like police officers. So essentially, in most of Eastern Germany, it was like more or less like a police state. There was a extensive network of secret police who would essentially just like spy on people constantly um, to make sure that they weren't planning on leaving or they weren't like doing anything bad. Um, my, actually my like, all time favorite movie is a film called The Lives of Others. And it's about life in East Germany in this like era in the, I think it's set in like the 70s or the 80s, um, in the era of this like really intense police state in East Germany where people were constantly being like, people were, the secret police were keeping tabs on them. Um, eventually, it's really interesting, eventually um, in the 90s when the Cold War ended, the secret police 
in Germany actually released all of the files um, that they had kept and they had like millions of files on like almost everybody in East Germany um, and people could go and request their files and they could go and read their own file about what the police, secret police knew about them during this era, um, about who had provided information on them. And so they were finding out like all of this really damaging stuff, like for instance, um, family members who had, you know, told secrets about them or their neighbors who had sort of ratted them out for doing X, Y, Z thing. Um, and it ended up causing like a lot of emotional trauma within, for these people, um, you know, within their own families or their own communities. Um, the film is subtitled and I think it's rated R, but if you have your parents' blessing, um, I definitely recommend it. It's so interesting um, and just like, wow, what a world, right? Um, anyways, so all that being said, life in uh, Eastern, the Eastern Bloc was pretty horrible. Um, and so in 1968, that starts like to, has, that's built up in a lot of places in the Eastern Bloc. Um, and so in uh, Czechoslovakia, which was part of the Eastern Bloc at the time, they started going through a wave of like a little bit of a revolution. Um, they elected this new guy to leadership um, he was a lot more sort of liberal. There was a li political liberalization in Czechoslovakia. They started to demand more rights and more freedoms. And of course, this is not like in line with what, uh, you know, anyone wants, <laughs> anyone in the Soviet Union wants. Um, and so eventually, um, under Brezhnev, uh, members of the Warsaw Pact, which is the Soviet's version of NATO, um, Warsaw Pact members brought in their militaries, uh, brought in like full on like tanks and everything, um, and went into Prague, which is was the capital of Czechoslovakia, and essentially like tried to shut the whole revolution down. Um, what ended up happening was that the citizens of Czechoslovakia just like kept the revolution going. They essentially um, held out a successful civilian armed resistance for eight months until eventually the um, the Soviet Union like crushed them. Um, uh, there's a really great, I hope this link still works, um, this video kind of goes over that. There's like a lot of primary footage um, of the event, so I definitely recommend it. Um, it was at this point that the Brezhnev Doctrine was established, and this was essentially Brezhnev's statement of ideas um, or ideals, where he said that the Soviet Union has a right to intervene in countries under their sphere of influence in order to protect communism. Basically, it legitimized using military force to maintain communism. So it's taking, um, you know, the Soviets' power, I think, to the next level, because he's saying, look, not only, like, are you under our sphere of influence, but now also you have to have communism. And if you don't have communism, we're gonna send the military in and we are gonna like do what we have to do. Um, and it's our right to do that. It is the Soviet Union's right. Um, so it's a really big extension of power in a lot of ways. And it legitimized and justified doing things like what uh, the Soviet Union did in Prague in 1968. Um, meanwhile, in 1970, things start to change. The relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, which had been so bitter and so like intensely, like intense animosity towards each other, starts to actually improve. Um, the probably some of the worst moments of the Cold War had been like 1962 at the Cuban Missile Crisis, when people literally thought like this is it, we're going to blow each other up, like we're on the brink of war. Um, but the relationship starts to cool, um, or I guess starts to warm, uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 70s. And this is a period that's known as detente. Uh, detente essentially means like a relaxation. It's a relaxation of tensions. Um, and so it's during this era that the United States and the Soviet Union become a lot more friendly with each other. They become a lot more open to working with each other. Um, and these, the two sort of cartoons here are emphasizing that um, this is the time when the United States and the Soviet Union go from being very close to a nuclear war, aka the Cuban Missile Crisis, to this weird phase of like almost friendship. Uh, this cartoon from uh, the Chicago Sun-Times in 1973 shows the, um, the bald eagle obviously representing America, you know, arm in arm with the bear representing the Soviet Union and they're pushing their child, uh, which is the, a 
it's supposed to be a dove. I know it looks kind of like a turkey or something, but it's supposed to be like a dove, which we know represents peace. Um, and the dove has got a little olive branch in its mouth. And so, you know, this is their child. They're willing to work together to create a peaceful future. Oh, isn't that so nice? Um, what did that actually look like? Um, one example of the changing relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union in this era of detente um, were the Helsinki Accords. These were basically like a statement of like joint, a joint statement of ideas. It didn't result in a treaty per se, but at least was a, a joint statement between the United States and the Soviet Union where they agreed to a couple of common um, things. Um, these things included um, trying to peacefully sort of negotiate conflicts instead of going into military conflict. Um, it included things like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like being okay with territories as they were, so not trying to change territorial lines um, and stuff like that. Essentially, what you really need to know is that the Helsinki Accords represent um, the United States and the Soviet Union really trying to work together and create um, guidelines for a more positive future between the two of them. The other thing um, that is clearly an, a product of detente uh, are the strategic arms limitation talks. Uh, these are like shortened to SALT, that, or their acronym is SALT, and you'll see there's like SALT 1 and SALT 2. Um, those are just different phases of these strategic arms limitation talks. Um, so this is in relation to the number, specifically the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles that both the United States and the Soviet Union have been building up since the 1950s. Um, people realize like, again, we saw this pattern play out after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy and Khrushchev had well, Kennedy mostly, had attempted to put in place a nuclear test ban treaty. It hadn't worked. This is like the better version of that, sort of. Um, the purpose of these SALT, of the SALT strategic arms limitation talks was to limit the amount of nuclear weapons, like to create limits for the amount of nuclear weapons that each side could have. Um, and as you can kind of see through the progression of the pictures, uh, SALT talks really first started taking place in the 70s between American President Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev. And then later in the 70s, Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, signed some SALT talks with Leonid Brezhnev. And then later in the 70s, uh, Ford's successor, President Carter, signed some agreements with him. None of these were all that like productive, I guess. I mean, especially if you look at the graph here of the US and Soviet Union stockpiled nuclear warheads, um, the United States stockpile does dip somewhat in the 1970s um, and it overall does go down, but like not significantly until the Cold War was actually over. And the Soviets uh, during this time period, their stockpile of nuclear weapons is only increasing. So how you know effective were these things? maybe not that effective. Um, but the whole idea here is that at least they are taking more um, like tangible steps towards creating a more peaceful world and a better relationship between the two superpowers. Um, so that's what we're gonna cover for today. Um, I will put out a lecture quiz for you to take and submit any questions that you might have. And next Tuesday, we'll have lecture again, and I'll be talking about the downfall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. So I will see you all then. Uh, how do I do this again? Stop all right. <laughs>